It's good to have all the children in here. This is our what we call a family night, and it's good to see a few new faces here on a Sunday night. So good to have you. And we call this our family night because we have all the kids in here, and so I've tried to gear the mess- messages towards that as we're trying to build character in each of our lives and certainly in the lives of our young people. Uh, children, I'll remind you, I'll be up here after the service. We'll have our box of candy and prizes. And so if you have your outline, we're on number three there uh, that we've been kind of filling in. You know, so you can show me the filled out outline, or you can come and answer a question and get one of those uh, pieces of candy or those prizes, so we'll do it right here at the front of the auditorium. I I can't help but think as we talk about this needed courage, this great character trait that we've been studying the last few weeks, boy, uh, in light of what we talked about this morning about holding fast our professional faith, my friend, you know what we need? We need a lot of courage, amen? And we're going to need courage going forward the days ahead, and so I think this is a great study for us uh, to encourage that. You'll remember, we've defined courage simply as this, the confidence that what I have to say say or do is true, right, and just in the sight of God. And as we even pointed out this morning, friend, it's getting to the point where we really don't care what man thinks, we only care what God thinks. And what's right in his sight, and that's the courage to do that, the confidence that what I am doing, what I I am believing and and, and saying and doing is right. We learned uh, from several examples how we would uh, describe it or what it looks like. Courage is responding to danger without thought of retreat. Responding to danger without thought of retreat. We saw that in the example of Jonathan and his armor bearer. Uh, We also looked at the example of David where we found out last week. It's also applying the resources I have in creative ways when faced with overwhelming odds. And a great story last week and from the scriptures and then also from nature. And uh, so uh, good instruction for us. So tonight we're going to add to that. We're going to add another description, another definition of what courage is. And uh, we also a story from the Bible and a story from nature. Tonight, the examples we'll look at, both from nature and God's Word, are going to be very familiar with you. You're going to know them both pretty well, I'm sure, but I trust be a good reminder or maybe a new look at the Bible story in some ways. And the Bible story we know well. The animal from nature we likely have all seen multiple times. Many of you have hunted them and most of us have eaten them. Amen. And you'll see who that, what that is. If you've come to a wild game dinner, we've eaten it, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And so we'll get to that in a moment. We're going to change things up a little bit, though, tonight. We're not going to start with our example from nature. We're going to start with our story from the pages of Scripture. And so our example from God's Word. The main character of our story from God's Word tonight, he was a, a man of great position, a man of prestige, a, a man of great power, really, if you were to consider his position within his country. In his own country, no doubt, he would be revered as a hero. He would have been held up and esteemed greatly. Yeah, he, no doubt, would have had some fame. There would have been some adoration for this guy. Uh, the ruler of the country to which he belonged Um, trusted in him probably like no one else. Uh, There's no one he probably trusted more. In fact, he he held him in high regard, probably more regard than anybody else. Uh, No doubt he was probably the toast of the town. As he made his way up and down the streets, no doubt people came up to him and greeted him by name because they would have all heard of him. He was a war hero. He was somebody who had done a great service for their country. And no doubt they'd come and pat him on the back and and get pictures. No, they didn't have pictures back then. But anyway, uh, they'd greet him and meet him and try to get to uh, to know him and just, oh, yeah, hey, there he is. And well, certainly been famous. Maybe maybe so often someone gave him a free chariot because uh, uh, he was their hero, whatever the case may be. He, He was that kind of guy because of his position, prestige. His power, boy, he would have been looked up to. In fact, you'd probably say, looking at this guy, he, he had the perfect life. There was somebody who was living what somebody might describe, though there is probably no such thing. Uh, he enjoyed that so-called best life. However, there was one thing that uh, just about destroyed him. It threatened to ruin everything he valued and everything that he had probably come to cherish. Look at 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse number 1 with me. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. Well, this man we know well, don't we? Naaman. And we heard this story. We've certainly studied it. You've read it. Some of you have taught it in Sunday school and so forth. The mention of his name, we probably would say that, oh, okay, so the thing that threatens this wonderful life 
that it be taken away. The thing that threatens to ruin it, um, this great thing he has going on, was probably those last five words stated in the verse. He was a leper. And he was a leper. Now, from a human standpoint, now listen to me tonight. Young people, listen to me. From a human standpoint, that, that, that might seem correct. We know it's leprosy to be a very devastating disease in that day. You've heard it described many different times in this same pulpit. There was little hope of recovering. And it was the kind of disease that once you were diagnosed with, um, it would turn your world upside down. It changed one's life completely. You would be removed from the life you knew with no real chance of going back in a sense. It was almost a death sentence. And so we see that and we read that and like, wow, that, that, that has to be it. That, that must be the thing that really threatened him. However, from a spiritual perspective, can I just tell you tonight that leprosy was barely a blip on the radar? From a spiritual perspective in Naaman's life, if you'd asked God, it would not have been God said, oh yeah, that poor Naaman boy, he just, he's going to struggle. The thing that threatens to take away the life he knows, that, that leprosy, that's, a, that's just a terrible plague, a terrible scourge. That, that's going to affect Naaman. No, that wouldn't have been a, a, a spiritual perspective. God wouldn't have named that. So you see, God would have named something different because there was something else in his life that was a far bigger problem. Now let me ask you tonight, or let me point out, isn't it kind of interesting that you and I, as humans, we seem to make the biggest thing out of the smallest thing spiritually? Sometimes we, take the, uh, we do a good job at majoring on the minors and totally ignoring the majors. We'll take a little something, and we'll make that a big deal. We'll get consumed with that, and we'll think that's the worst thing ever. That's the biggest thing that needs our attention. And, and yet the reality is, spiritually speaking, it's not that big of a deal. It shouldn't be a big deal. Those things sometimes garner our attention and our thoughts in, in such a way that it, it, it takes away. And we miss the bigger issues. We miss the bigger problems in our lives. You see, Naaman had a much bigger issue going on in his life. And he was going to have to display some courage to overcome it with God's help. We know the story well. There's a little Jewish girl. She was a servant, a maid that had been stolen and taken away from her homeland. She had just came into, and we would not call it coincidence, we would call it sovereign direction. <laughs> Our sovereign God had, had directed that she become Naaman's wife's maid. And certainly known the malady that, that had hit her, uh, her master, she, she spoke up and said, Hey, boy, uh, good news, man. If, there was, if he was in Israel, boy, there's a prophet over there that could help him with his leprosy. And I, I don't know about you, but those are the types of moments. Huh? Maybe you call them hallmark moments. I don't know. The kinds of moments you like to go, oh, wow, that would have been something just to, to be there, to imagine kind of uh, what we might, what the world would describe the changing of fate. I, I don't think it's that. I, I would describe it this way. Listen carefully. It's the moment when hopeless despair turns into hopeful possibility. It's the moment when hopeless despair turns into hopeful possibility. I just imagine there's Naaman. He didn't want to get dressed. The leprosy is consuming him. He can't go out in the public maybe anymore. And he's sitting there on the end of his bed. And, and the maid has said something to his wife. His wife comes running into the bedroom. Naaman, Naaman, you, you got to hear this. You won't believe what, what Naomi said. That's not her real name. I just made that up, okay? Nice building. Yeah, you won't believe what Naomi said. Naomi said there's a, there's a prophet over in Israel. Like it. Could you imagine the perking up, the hope? That then filled Naaman's breast, that, that, the, the hope that now got him to get out of bed, to get dressed. And in fact, as we'll see in a moment, the reality that it caused him to even go to his king as his king heard about it. But I want to step back in a second. I want to remind you and I of something tonight. Because for Naaman, man, things le looked hopeless. Things look like the, the life was going to be turned upside down and terrible. And, and some of us, maybe even today, and something's going on in your life, you say, man, this is, this is hopeless. Well, I want to tell you tonight, just, just like there was a prophet in Israel that could take away his leprosy, my friend, you have a God in heaven that can do anything for you. There is no reason to be in hopeless despair when you know the God of heaven. And what, much like him, can I tell you what we sometimes fail to do? What was Naaman required to do? He was required to go to the prophet in Israel. 
My, do you find in your life, as I do in mine, sometimes I fail to take things to God as I should? I fail to go to him and be reminded that I can take anything to God and he can do something about anything, and he's willing to do so. He's willing to act on our behalf. And, man, I am thankful for the hope you and I have. I'm grateful we never have to face life with a helpless or hopeless despair. We could always have that hope in our God, that hopeful possibility that he will do great things. I'm thankful for that. Well, that word reaches the king of Syria. He hears about the story. Hey, maybe one of his servants, maybe even Naaman himself shared it. And boy, he gets excited. Look at verse number 5 of 2 Kings 5. Notice it. And the king of Syria said, go to Go. Can you sense the excitement? Can you sense the intensity? Go to, go, and I will send a letter into the king of Israel. And he departed. That's speaking of Naaman. And he took with him 10,000, or 10, excuse me, 10 talents of silver and 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. Needless to say, the king of Israel about has a heart attack. I'm supposed to do what? You want me to do what? Notice the next verse. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes. And said, Am I God? To kill and to make alive, that the man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. He thought the king of Syria was picking a fight. He wants to start a quarrel. He wants to get us going. He, he's just saying this so he knows we can't do this, and there's no way this is going to happen. And here is Naaman. And Naaman has come. It's amazing to me, isn't it, just to point out what we read in the verse. It has, it's about $20,000 worth of silver, $60,000 worth of gold, 10 handsome suits or changes of raiment. Uh, and that's crazy. And he was brought that as a gift for the man that was going to heal him from the leprosy. It's a conservative estimate, no doubt. But in those days, it would have been an astronomical fortune. So he comes to the king of Israel. Is the king can do nothing for him, but then he sent to the house of the prophet, the one that the little maid girl had referenced, Elisha. Now this is where the story gets good. Here is where Naaman's biggest and greatest problem, the threat to his wonderful life, is first exposed. You see, he comes and he knocks. The Bible describes it, that he stood before the door. And so we can imagine maybe he knocked or maybe a servant did, whatever the case may be. I, I could just imagine maybe he had a servant go up and knock because that was probably beneath him in some ways in his position. He would have had a plethora of servants and those with him, probably some soldiers and things too. And so it went and knocked on the door and he's standing back. And here he is as he's anticipating this. He, he's saying, okay, the prophet's going to come out. He must have seen the, the great train that came up and all the the Camels or horses, whatever the case may be, and all these people. He must have noticed it from his window. Somebody must have told him, and he's soon going to come out, and he's going to greet this powerful, important man from Syria. And he says, ah, he's going he's to welcome me in. And he's imagining probably in his mind, man, this is going to be something to see. When this prophet goes to work, he's going to do some awesome, miraculous, religious thing where, man, it's going to, maybe it'll go dark, maybe there'll be lightning and everything else, and, and man, this is going to be wonderful. He's anticipating all these things. The door opens. That was pretty good, actually. <laughs> Okay, anyway, going back to the story. Okay, so the door opens, and, and he's anticipating a prophet. And we, I don't know what a typical prophet looks like, but he's had a, like, who is this? It's not a prophet. And maybe it's a young girl, a young boy, or maybe it's Gehazi, who we know to be a servant. But nonetheless, he's like, this isn't a servant. And, and maybe he said, hey, somebody ask him, is he the prophet? And the guy at the door, no, 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 I'm not the prophet. I, I'm just a servant with a, a message for you. Say, what? Now, wait a minute. You know I'm naming, right? Yes, sir, we know. Word was sent that you were coming. The king of Israel sent word, and his emissary came and told us that you'd be coming. So, so he knows that I'm from Syria, that, I, that I'm one of the greatest warriors of, uh, of Syria, that God used me to deliver the entire nation of Syria, and he's not coming out? He's not going to come and see me? No, sir, he sends this message. I tell you, in that moment, in that moment, you can just imagine how angry Naaman becomes. 
He feels slighted. He feels angry, offended, and disappointed. Now listen to me and listen to me carefully. In that moment, his pride takes a great hit. And it was the being exposed as his greatest threat. Now it's interesting. And we'll see it play out here. He views this treatment as completely unacceptable. And yet he misses that God in his mercy is exposing something in his life that is a greater threat than leprosy could ever be. Do not miss it tonight, Christian. God has a message for Naaman, and maybe for you and I tonight, the reality, boy, we can get caught up with the, the minor things and miss the major things. For name, and that was true. Look at verse 10 and 11. Let, let's just see the message, right? And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But verse 11, but Naaman was wroth, and went away and said, Behold, I thought. You know, sometimes when I'm in a cantankerous mood or whatever the case may be, my children said, Well, I think. I said, That's your first problem. That's kind of the problem with Naaman, isn't it? He'll say, hey, oh, I thought. Now, wait a second. The problem is he's not thinking with his head. Now, don't miss this. He's thinking with the pride in his heart. Notice what he thinks. I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Don't you love that? I'll say, Naaman, you watch too many Hollywood movies. Man of God's coming, oh, he's shaking his hands, he's going to strike the ground, and oh, you know, it's going to be this wonderful event. And all that I get is a servant with a message at the door and go, go, go wash in a river. You see the conflict going on in Naaman's heart and mind. And, wait a minute, doesn't he know who I am? Doesn't he know what I have done, what I have accomplished? A, guy, a man of my stature and position, man, I deserve him to come out and stand before me. I, I deserve for God to do a, a wondrous work in my, uh, on my behalf, a great act. Can I want to tell you right now, in that moment, you know what happened? Naaman's little leprosy took a back seat to the greatest problem, the greatest threat in his life is pride. It's exposed. God says, no, 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 Naaman. <laughs> The leprosy, blip on the radar. Your pride, going to destroy you. Do you hear me, Christian? Your pride's going to destroy you. You let pride get in the way from obeying the instructions of God. You let pride get in the way of doing God's will and doing it God's way. You let pride get in the way, friend, it will destroy you. That's not just my words. That's what God says. And I share with you just three descriptions of pride that the Bible gives us. Notice it, if you will. Three verses. I encourage you at least write down the reference. You probably know them well. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18 says this. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Pride leads to what? Destruction. Haughty spirit, a fall. See, I put it this way, a little pride is a big problem. Young people, you got to get hold of that. A little pride is a big problem. Bible makes it clear. Number two, notice this verse, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 23. A man's pride shall exalt him. No. A man's pride shall what? Bring him low. Bring him low. Honor, however, shall uphold the humble in spirit. Hmm, interesting. Let's throw another one, Less Shoes maybe, one of my favorite little books in the Bible, the book of Obadiah. It's in there. Chapter 1, verse 3 says this. It's speaking to the nation of Edom. Uh, the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Isn't that an amazing statement? Your pride has deceived you. you. Notice how he describes it, that thou dwellest in the clefts of the rock, and whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? Someday we'll study that little small book of Obadiah, it's a great thing, a great little book, and it talks about dealing with Edom, God's judgment on them. They thought because of their geographical location and other things, they were almost untouchable. I'll just tell you right now, ain't no one untouchable when it comes to God's arm. He can reach anybody. And that's kind of what, you know what happens? Pride deceives us. 
Now, I would tell you there's a threefold devastation of pride. And I would encourage you, young people, you write this down. Remind yourselves of this. When you're tempted to get a big head, think too highly of yourself, you remind yourself of there, this. There is a devastation of pride. It's three things from these verses. Number one, pride leads to destruction. Number two, pride leads to dissension. It will bring you low. And number three, pride leads to deception. Pride leads to deception. Three things are the consequences of pride having a free reign in our lives, of us entertaining that I'm, I'm much greater than I really am. I, I'm something special, and it will lead to destruction. It will lead to dissension, bringing me low, and it will bring to deception. Those correlate to those three verses. They are great truths for each of us to grab a hold of tonight. We don't want pride in our life. We don't want to entertain that. And these are the things that are on the horizon of Naaman's life. May I submit to you again? May I just point out again? It was Naaman's pride, not his leprosy, that would destroy him and bring him low. And the same is true for each of us. Pride is a destroyer. Pride will cause your descent to bring you low. Pride will deceive each one of us if we let it rule the roost. I want you to turn your attention back to the, the passage here, and I want you to notice, well, what did pride do in Naaman? Calls him to balk at the orders. I'm not going to do that. You want me to go dip in those dirty Israeli waters? Well, back home, our rivers there are so much more clean. Why don't I just go wash in them? You know what's interesting? It's both interesting and sad that often <laughs> pride deceives us into believing that our ways are better than God's ways. Now listen to me, young people, you can answer this, okay? What if Naaman had gone back to Syria and had dipped in those rivers instead of the Jordan River? Would his leprosy have been gone? No way. He could have dipped seven times 70. And after 490 times of coming back up, guess what? He'd be the same Naaman with the same leprosy, and I'll tell you, with the same pride. With the same pride. It's funny how pride can deceive us, isn't it? My way is better than God's way. Those waters are cleaner. Those, it would have been so much easier. God, well, this is the best way. And I think sometimes just God looks from heaven and just shakes his head at us. Because our pride deceives us. My friend, pride, <laughs> notice the end result. Notice what, it, what he reaps in his life. Verse 12, notice it. Are not Abana and far, far, uh, far Par, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Man not washing them and be clean? Notice the next statement. Here's the end result. So he turned and went away in a rage. He's angry. He's mad. If we could describe it in maybe our modern terms, he's like, I'm done with this prophet. I'm done with this God. I'm done with this nation Israel. This is ridiculous. And so he stomps off and he jumps in his chariot ready to go home. In this moment, in between verses 12 and 13, I want you to see, you know what? Pride is just about to win. What does pride bring? Oh, destruction. Pride brings dissension. And my friend, pride is going to show up and bring deception to him, as it already has. As he's in his chariot, and I just imagine, in fact, I, I read some commentators, some believe that he actually got down the road a little bit before uh, his servants were able to interject. And I, I can just imagine he's in his chariot, he's grabbing the reins, and he's just angry mad. And, he's up, and before the reins hit the back of the horse, his servants run up, hey, sir, hey, just wait a second. You love how they speak up. It's great. They come near, they reason with him. You know what they do? They help remove a little bit of the deception that pride was causing. They help to remove the blinders of pride. And boy, can I just encourage you to beware of the blinders of pride, friend? Like pride has such a way of putting blinders on us. Most of you know, like when a horse is racing, they'll put blinders on so it can focus on one thing. You know what pride often does? Causes us just to focus one way, the wrong way. He's angry. He's mad. I, I, why should I do this? This is not, I, that, that could be so much better. He's just focused on that. Uh, pride deceives. It can put blinders on us in any situation we find ourselves in. So be careful. Be careful. Notice what the servants say in verse number 13. 
And the servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. I don't know what a great thing would have been for him. Maybe it was to scale the mountain carrying a camel. I don't know. I don't know what a great thing. He's a warrior. Maybe it was go defeat this army all by yourself. I don't know what a great thing. What a, the servants point out says, listen. You know what? That would have gone well with your pride. You would have jumped all over. You said, that's a piece of cake. I can do that. But now he just says, wash and be clean. And, and on the surface, on the surface, don't miss this. On the surface, these instructions say, oh, that's simple. Why wouldn't he just do it? It's simple. Just wash and be clean. Go dip seven times. But were they really that simple? I don't think so. For one whose greatest difficulty threat was his pride, following these instructions was as difficult as it came. Because it meant he had to humble himself. See, I'd put it this way. Obedience to these commands spelled death to his pride. It meant disregarding everything he thought himself to be. Ah, his prestige, his power, his position. This was a death knell. For his pride. I got to obey the servant of a prophet who told me to go dip in those dirty waters. Me, Naaman, the great hero and deliverer of the nation of Syria. I have to go do that? Yeah. You see, it wasn't just about humbling himself to the obedience of those instructions. It was humbling himself to the obedience of the God in heaven. Because you know what God was doing, and don't miss this, because God uses circumstances, God uses instructions and things all the time to do this. God needed to do a little heart surgery. God needed to expose that it wasn't his leprosy that was the greatest threat, but the pride of his heart. You see, he had a display, Naaman did, a courage and surrender, uh, that, that thing that was greater than anything, uh, his pride. And it had to be a, a courage and a surrender greater than he displayed on any battlefield. He had to do it now. You know, this is a good story. Why? Because he relented. What did he do? Well, he let go of his pride and he let God have his way. Brings for a good ending to the story, doesn't it? He, he let go of his pride. Now listen. He overcomes and defeats the pride that would have destroyed him. How? By causing him to suffer for the rest of his life with leprosy. And maybe that leprosy would have taken his life. That leprosy for sure would have separated him from fans and family. No more would he have been a hero in, in Syria. He would have been a castaway. Someone rendered to the leprosy colony in Syria if they acted much like the Israelites. He overcame the pride that would have brought him lower than he had ever been. Could you imagine going from the great celebrated deliverer of Syria to the <laughs> outcast pushed aside lepers of Syria? But nothing but a leper that they despise and look down at. He overcame the pride that had almost deceived him to the degree that he made the worst decision of his life. Angry? We're out of here. Load up those chariots. He almost made the worst decision. Why? Because pride had deceived him. But praise the Lord from verses 14 and 15. Notice it. Then when he down, he dipped himself seven times in Jordan. And I just would have loved to listen to him every time he came up for the first sex. His heart slowly breaking. Maybe the humility showing in his countenance. If that happens, you reveal what's in your heart often in your countenance. He dipped himself seven times in Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child. Some of us older people would like that right now. Amen. Amen. That'd be good. And he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, a great host, no doubt. And he came and he stood before him. Now, don't you like this? Isn't this great? He comes back to his house. Who's he expecting? The servant. Who comes out? Elisha. Isn't that funny? I think that's a great part of the story. Why? Because you know what humble, uh, Na uh, Naaman is now? He's humbled. He's humble. He would have gladly spoken to the servant, but Elisha comes out. 
And I love this because why? He's understood there's been a heart change. <laughs> he stood before him and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Amen. Amen. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Man, but wait a second. Are you the same Naaman? <laughs> yes and no. I am leprosy free, but that's not the biggest thing. My pride did not win the day. I've humbled myself before the God of Israel. You know, may I just put it this way? Sometimes it takes great courage to be humble. It does. There's no doubt about that. It takes a great courage sometimes on our part to humble ourselves. Remember that. You see, it can require courage on our part to renounce our pride, to humble ourselves before the Lord, and obey the instructions that he has given us that pride makes it difficult to do, that pride has gotten in the way. You see, tonight we're going to add to that outline, describe courage as this. Following difficult instructions in the face of danger. Now, I readily admit that example here of Naaman is not that he faced some great danger, but the fact is, he faced a great opposition in his pride, a great enemy. And he had to make, have the courage uh, to defeat and overcome that pride and obey the difficult instructions. Well, when it comes to the animal we study tonight, it really is about the danger or, that is fear, facing fear. As I said earlier, the animal, now as we kind of change focal points here and see another example now from nature, the animal for tonight is a familiar one. As I said, some of you have certainly have eaten it. Maybe some of you have eaten it recently, okay? It is the beautiful wood duck. The beautiful wood duck. The wood duck is one of the few species, as described, and it's one of the few of its kind that actually builds its nest in the hollow of a tree. And so it will locate that, spend many hours, maybe even days, trying to locate that uh, in, a, in a wooded area near a river or quiet lake. And the mother duck will always ensure that the area around the nest, like where the, the tree is, is free from obstacles that might injure the departing young ducklings. It looks for two things that we would say are the greatest factors when it's trying to find a hollow in a tree where it can put its nest and lay its eggs. And uh, that is simply this, the height of the hollow from the ground, okay? So obviously that makes sense. You don't want one real low when any kind of varmint can get in, right? And eat it, eggs, whatever the case may be, raccoon, something like that that likes to eat an egg and, and so forth. So the height of it and then also the depth of the hole or recess. What that is is simply this. A young duckling, and we'll see uh, here, doesn't stay in there long. And when it's time to get out, it's got to reach from inside that hollow to get out of the, the hole. And so that depth has to be just right where it can climb and get out. And we'll see that play out here in a moment as we'll describe it a little bit more. It's been interesting, though, as people have looked for the nest of the wood duck. They've been found as low as five feet off the ground and as high as 60 feet in the ground. Pretty amazing if you think about it, a 60-foot nest that's up there. Hopefully those ducklings aren't afraid of heights, amen? They are normally, though, between 10 and 20 feet. Obviously, then the average would be about 15, but 10 to 20 feet from the ground. Uh, the mother duck, during the time after picking the, the hollow where to put the nest, and obviously um, checking on the eggs and laying the eggs, as we'll see here in a moment, when she goes back and forth to that hole, it's interesting, she won't go there directly. She'll go to a nearby tree and kind of scan everything to make sure there's no enemies, no, pre no predators uh, that are watching her to see her go to the hole. So she'll be very protective when she uh, returns home there of uh, both the hollow and the offspring. She can lay up to 12 eggs and uh, does so one egg at a time. And so as she lays the egg, she'll cover it up with feathers and other things, and, and then she'll leave, and, and she'll do that up to 12 times and laying those eggs. You know, quite interesting. When they're all laid, then she'll uh, begin the incubation process, sitting on them and, and such, uh, ensuring that they all hatch at the same time then, producing that heat to do so. One of the most interesting things that a mother duck does. It happens when the, day, and the duckling's about two to three days from breaking out of the egg. She'll, she'll listen for that faint peeping inside the eggs. And when she hears them, the mother duck will actually start talking to them. You know, some of us have done that, amen? When our children have been, maybe the first one has been in the womb, you start talking to her, right? Maybe giving advice, and sometimes I know there's been many who have even put a headset on, right, Amen? 
played music or played something. Don't look at me like I'm weird. I know some of you have done it. Okay, you talked to that baby, and you spoke it, and so forth. There's a reason behind it, that, and I just don't have to be neat to kind of see a duck, mother duck talking to those little eggs. There's a reason for it, though, as you can imagine, as maybe some of us do it for the reason uh, that she does. What does it accomplish? It certainly familiarizes the duckling with the sound of her voice before they even hatch. So there's a, there's a connection there. There's, uh, because of her voice, and obviously that's important because as they hatch, it's not, soon at, not too soon or not too far after that that they need to listen to her for directions and instructions and so forth. And so it provides for some familiarity there. Most of you will certainly already know this. The ducklings are also created by God with a sharp protrusion at the end of their bills. That's called the egg tooth. There's many animals like that. That, and that's some, Even the hog-nosed snake, which we talked about last week, um, <laughs> it had something like that to break its egg, and then it falls off on, this, on the snake. But nonetheless, um, they have one. It, scra- it uses it to scrape and chip against the shell uh, to make a hole, and eventually then opening big enough for it to emerge. It's interesting also, the egg tooth, it uses that and its two webbed feet to climb up to the hole <laughs> so it can get out of the hollow, the nest, and so forth. So it'll use that too and that'd be kind of fun to see a camera inside the hollow see him climbing like that but it will use that at the same in the same way you say well that's all wonderful and it's fun learning about a wood duck but how in the world does a wood duck show courage well here's one of the more interesting things i think about this duck is the mother duck sure doesn't let the grass grow (laughs) under the feet of her ducklings she usually leads them away from the nest within 24 hours of hatching sometimes sooner She'll often wait and see down below the hollow there the, in the tree. She'll make sure there's no predators and everything's safe, and then, and then she'll proceed with that, and it, it's within 24 hours, sometimes sooner. She will take them to what's called a brood pond. And that is, as we said earlier, she'll try to find a, a hollow, a place for the nest that is somewhere close to a stream or a lake or whatever the case may be, a pond, I should say, a pond or a lake, and where there's enough food and protection for her to stay there for several months so the, she can train them in swimming and finding food and things like that. And so, um, yet you can imagine there is a whole lot of danger in the journey. And it takes a tremendous amount of courage for those little ducklings to leave that nest and, and Follow the mother duck to the brood pond. It could be up to a mile away. And as it does, you can imagine that that wood floor, that wooded floor, that fur, 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 excuse me, can be full of hungry predators, (laughs) enemies. Bullfrogs will even attack and eat a duckling. Turtles, snakes, owls, hawks, mink, and raccoons. And yet it all starts with a courageous act on the part of the day-old ducklings. When the mother's standing there at the bottom of the hollow, and she's sure that there's no threats, and she's looking around, there's no predators, and when she does that, she, she's okay, everything's safe, she gives a signal. And you can imagine all these ducklings coming to the hole, the hole and, and they kind of peep out and see what's going on, what's mom saying? And they're looking out, and mom gives the signal, and she's saying basically this, jump. It's time to go. Now, that can be pretty scary for a little duckling, isn't it? Uh, you think about that, if they could talk, which they can, if you hear them talk, you might have issues, okay? So the little ducklings can't talk, but you can imagine they, they'd be scared, and, and that'd be a little fearful if you think of it. They scramble there to look down, and, and uh, she, she urges them, come down, join me here at the foot of the tree. And you can, they can't fly, you certainly would know that, so it's more of a controlled fall, if anything. For most of them, it isn't even that. They just kind of go, woo, no parachute, no nothing. It's pretty amazing if you think about it. And in fact, they have, it has been said you take an average height for a nest of about 15 feet, um, that would be equivalent to a 150-foot jump for a man, equal to about a 10 to 11-story building. No thank you, amen? So it's a pretty fearful fall or jump, depending on what you call her, right? But as each duckling jumps, God has designed them wondrously. And I love this study as we study nature. It reaffirms that there is a great creator behind everything. These things did not happen. It's amazing. You see even the picture here. It uses its webbed feet and, and such to, to help it in its fall. Its downy wings help break the impact of a fall. And just a few seconds later, each one safely bounces on the grass at the base of the tree. As each one comes down, then the mother really intensifies her call, her urgency to the other ones. Because now she's watching not only these ducklings here from predators, she's also trying to get everybody down. And so uh, she's hurriedly trying to encourage them, come, come, come. 
when she can no longer expose the vulnerable ducklings to danger, she gives one last call to any left in the nest, in the hollow. And she waddles away um, with the ones that showed courage to make the journey to the brood pond. It takes a lot of courage to follow the mother, but to not do so means certain death. If they don't do it, they'll be left alone and certainly will die. See, to any left behind, their lack of courage and following difficult instructions in the face of danger will prove to be their end. Friend, I want to tell you, sometimes in life, it calls for courage. And there are many things that make following instructions difficult. For the duckling, no doubt, it is fear, as we've just described. Fear of the unknown and what's down there. They've never been out of the nest. <laughs> there are so many hours, 24 hours. It has to jump, certainly to fear is that, but it's courageous nonetheless. And it reaps the benefits of the decision to be courageous. For Naaman, what was the thing that stood in, in play? Pride. But he was courageous in humbling himself, and in so doing, he, only, he not only saw the leprosy disappear, but he won an important victory over his greater threat, his pride. You realize what he reaped because of that? In Naaman's life, it led to the realization that there is only one God to be worshipped with our words and our living. Yeah, boy, it didn't take the removal of the leprosy for him to see that. It took the removal of his pride. And then God took care of the leprosy. See, that day he humbly surrendered to the one true God, choosing to follow and obey him from that time forward. You remember, we don't have time to read it, but the next few verses, he asked Elisha, he goes, hey, when I go back, I, I, the king, when he goes in to worship his God, I don't want to bow down to that God. Is God going to forgive me for going in there? And if I have to kneel down so to help him, will God forgive me? My, what a heart change, amen? He says, I don't want to, I don't want to offend the God of heaven. I, I don't want to allow anything to get in that way. What a heart change. He humbly surrendered. May I remind you tonight, it was Peter who simply said, For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. When you and I have courage to say, Okay, pride, I'm kicking you to the curb. You're not going to rule this. You're not going to cause destruction in my life. You're not going to cause dissension in my life. You're not going to deceive me any longer. You know what a great outcome of that is? We get to get closer to God. He gives greater grace. He helps us. In fact, we saw it already. He honors the humble in spirit. God draws near to that person. And if there was anyone in the New Testament that seemed to wrestle with Paul with pride, excuse me, it was Peter, wasn't it? And he says, man, I found out for God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So we too can demonstrate courage by embracing humility, defeating pride as we strive to be obedient to God and everything. But it takes courage. I'll leave you with this and we'll done. we're done. Okay? Do you have the courage in you to overcome that which threatens to hinder you in obeying God? For you, there might be some fear. In your life, it may be fear that says, I don't know if I can do that, if I can follow through on that. Will you have the courage to do that, to obey and follow those difficult commands? Maybe for you, it's pride. Maybe you find yourself like Naaman, and boy, your way is always seeming better to you. And those instructions of God, the things that God's will has shown, that's just, a, I don't want that, I want to do this. Maybe it's pride. My friend, whatever it is, are you willing to humble yourself? Are you willing to allow God to work in you and through you to overcome that so you and I can be faithful, obedient believers? And the outcome? Ha, <laughs> we get to draw closer to God, we get to get more grace, and we get to please our Heavenly Father. What a joy it will be one day to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But my friend, if you let pride get in the way, it won't happen. If you let fear get in the way, it's not going to happen. Would you have some courage tonight?